Let's get this trading week started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equities up a quarter of 1% on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. After a decade of excess, here come the cuts. There has been this disconnect. Despite major headline news about layoffs, that has not translated into a broad-based weakening of the labor market. There's clear divergence going on. First, we see stage one, where businesses begin to freeze hiring. We are uh, looking at job, uh, you know, the layoff announcements, they're picking up. Stage two, we start to see sizable layoffs. We're going to see these layoffs that we were just witnessing show up. Then we start to see that filter into the broader data. We just don't see that happening right now. It's coming from sectors like financial services and tech. You talk about tech sector layoffs. Yes, the, there is some softening in the labor market. It's inevitable that we see some of those job cuts. But it isn't in the sectors that the Fed is really worried about. Let's start the discussion. JP Morgan, Stephanie Roth joins us now. Aberdeen's James Athey alongside us. Stephanie, first to you. What can we learn about the adjustment process that big tech is going through right now? Yeah, this is probably the first sign of, of the slowdown that we're going to see in the labor market. Tech companies overhired in, in the bulk of the pandemic, and it's not surprising that that's the first area that we're seeing weakness. Now, the, the jobs picture last week was a bit mixed, but we do expect that what we saw from the unemployment rate to be a signal of, of what's to come. It, it, unemployment should should start to rise, uh, and it might take a couple more months before we really see the, the cracks in the labor market. But that should that should come. What, what the Fed has done is enough, and we do think that that should result in a material slowdown. We'll probably see more layoffs uh, spread throughout the economy, but it might take a little bit more time. Stephanie, as things stand though, what we see is in a narrow part of the economy, it's in tech. You see it in the likes of Lyft, you see it in Twitter, you see it in the chip makers, Qualcomm making cuts, Intel spending cuts, layoffs, etc. Do you see this early signs then of a broader breakdown in the labour market or is it still too early to tell? Well, but we do think that we'll see, we'll see that play out in the rest of the economy. It's just a little bit early. This is a bit siloed at the moment, but we should start to see a slowdown in, 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 in job gains and that should ultimately result in, in job cuts. But we think it's still early. We'll probably see that in, around the second quarter of next year. Uh, we're expecting a recession to hit in mid-2023, and that, that's a clear indication of that. Uh, James Athey, your take on this conversation, and welcome to the show, mate, as always. Hi, John. Yeah, yeah I mean, I agree. I think what we're seeing is uh, exactly as, as just been described, big tech over overhired, essentially. These, these businesses extrapolated their blitz-scale growth far into the future when most of them really didn't have any right to do so. They're, these businesses are more cyclical than had been assumed. And in a lot of cases, they've never really been profitable. They don't have IP, which necessarily protects their position. So they're open to competition. And, and yet investor cash had been thrown at them with abandon. You know, when I see a company like DocuSign with seven and a half thousand employees, I really do scratch my head and wonder what they're all doing uh, for what is relatively simple, straightforward business. Um, and, and I think we're seeing the sort of tail end of the pandemic effect, right? We had a huge amount of goods consumption relative to services because we were all locked up at home shopping on, uh, you know, on Internet retailers. And then as the economies have opened up, we've seen this long tail of a, a switch back into services consumption. It's gone on longer than I expected. Um, but this is a services economy. Service business is, is low productivity and it's it's. Um, you know, extremely heavy on labour. So it's no surprise that the labour market has remained strong while service consumption is, is as healthy as it is. But the, the shock to incomes, the shock to the economy from this tightening of monetary policy hasn't yet played out. And when it does, I'm sure we'll see a joblessness. Uh, James, you mentioned the pandemic. Stephanie mentioned the pandemic. I'm trying to work out whether the excess that we're trying to unravel here is two years' worth or a decade's worth of excess. James, which one is it? <laughs> That's a good question, John. Yeah, it's both. Um, there has been excess in many areas for a long time, um, just because of 
you know, this ultra easy monetary policy forever, the constant um, provision of liquidity by central banks into markets, which has caused this misallocation of capital. It's caused far too much, uh, far too big a percentage of the GDP pie to go to owners of capital relative to labor. And, and that's a big problem that we need to resolve on a more secular basis. Uh, but on a cyclical basis, obviously, when you print money in the size that many economies were, the US in particular, and just start handing out checks to people, then that creates a different kind of excess. So I think the answer is both. Stephanie, do you view it as both? Yeah, totally agree there. Uh, a combination of a you know a decade worth of, of excess hiring in the space, and we think that the the next decade might look a little bit different from that perspective. But we're also seeing a, a sort of cyclical near term over hiring in, in some of these areas, and we're just working off some of that froth. James, now the next area within. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, carry on, please. Sure. The next area within the economy is is going to be the services sector. Right now, that's that's incredibly firm, but at some point, the excess cash is going to start ro rolling over. The impact from higher rates is just going to feed through the economy and the services sector is likely next. James, if you two both agree that this could be a decade's worth of excess, James, I wonder what this means for the future of this benchmark in the United States on the S&P. I had this conversation with Michael Schaul of Marketfield a little bit earlier this morning and he made the point that he thinks if you bought the top in the equity market just in the last 12 months that you're going to have several years' worth of remorse that we could face a decade, a lost decade, for big tech. And because of the waiting on the S&P, perhaps big challenges in our future for holding the index, the market cap weighted S&P 500. Yeah, I mean, again, I think similar to, to the end of the 90s and the early noughties, it's not to say that there weren't brilliant businesses in there. It wasn't to say that there, there wasn't an ongoing technical, uh, technological revolution and that that would be hugely successful for, for the winners. It's just the way in which that, that was blindly applied across the piece to all manner of companies which were assumed to be world leaders and world dominant long before they were. And indeed, they were assumed to have a potential marketplace which was global in nature. And actually, a lot of them, it was much more niche and it probably wasn't anywhere near as big as was being suggested. And therefore, there's a lot of froth to come out. And as you've described, these are market cap weighted indices. So the performance of those companies led them to be dominant in terms of their uh, size within the index. I think when you look at the size of energy, the outperformance of the energy sector over the last two, three, four, five years now, it's been a leading sector in terms of performance, but it's still only, what, 5%, something around there of the S&P, whereas tech's still above 20. That sort of um, transition, if you like, back to the old economy in some respects versus some of these tech companies which I don't think really are the sort of world changing businesses that some have assumed, that's unlikely to happen quickly. I think that's a much slower burn. So Stephanie, what do you say to a generation of investors who have been told stay along the index by the market cap weighted S&P 500 over a decent enough time horizon, let's say five years, it will deliver? What's the challenge to that view now? I still think that that's the right view. Hold it, holding the index, and especially with the U.S. compared to, to the rest of the world, we still think that it could outperform. We also just have to, to level set a little bit. We might not experience the returns that we saw over the last decade, but we still think that that return should be decent. So maybe think about growth or growth returns looking more like some of the rest of the index um, rather than the index performing terribly over the next couple of years. Futures right now up a third of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up a third of 1% also. Talking about the big cuts we're seeing in big tech, seeing it in Meta as well. Meta planning to begin large-scale layoffs this week. That's expected to affect many thousands of employees. An announcement planned to come as soon as Wednesday, according to the Wall Street Journal this morning. Mike McKee has a different story. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. Well, Stephanie was right. This is kind of siloed within tech, but it's also siloed within the silo because it's really tech firms that have earnings or financial issues right now that are laying people off. It doesn't show up in the broader economy. You take a look at the layoff rate, according to the JOLTS figures, and it's under 1%. And obviously, jobless claims haven't been rising at all. So at this point, right now, the rest of the economy gets up every morning and goes to work. And also, we're hearing anecdotal reports that a lot of startups out in Silicon Valley are licking their chops because a lot of talented people are going to be available in the tech space. Is it going to happen? Well, uh, we don't know yet. This is a kind of a different situation than previous recessions. And yes, there are recession calls out there. But look at this survey from the conference board of CEOs. Going into the fourth quarter, 81% said business conditions had worsened and 85% said they expect a recession next year. 
but 44% are still expanding their labor force and 86% say their capital budgets are going to remain the same or increase. Companies don't see a really bad time ahead. So it all brings us to, and I know you're looking forward to this on Thursday, John, the CPI report, to what happens with inflation and how strict the Fed has to be for how long. The New York Fed has an underlying inflation gauge that tells us more about perhaps where turning points are than actual uh, the actual inflation rate. And it peaked in March and has been coming down since. You look at the two ISMs for both services and especially manufacturing, and they peaked at about the same time, and they have been coming down. A lot of people think that we might see inflation fall faster than Wall Street is anticipating. I'm not making any predictions, but if it did, then we would see the Fed react more quickly. And this could be a whole different kind of recession and recovery that we've seen before, a lot of it pandemic related. I'll get someone else to answer that question. Mike McKee, thank you. And so that's someone else. Stephanie, that's you. Can inflation fall as quickly as it rose? Is it stickier on the way down? There might be some elements of, of it being sticky. We certainly have seen that this year. There, you know, shelter inflation has been a big contributor to, to, to core inflation. And now Wall Street has come to the conclusion that shelter is likely to, to, to start cooling down, but it might take until, until the beginning of next year. If you look at real-time measures of rent inflation, they've actually contracted on the month. So there are elements with inflation that are a bit lagging, uh, and certainly we're starting to see the disinflation within goods. Services inflation should start cooling in the first half of next year, in part because we expect the material slowdown and growth. Look how quickly things have flipped in one particular segment. Look at the chip makers. James Athey, look at Qualcomm. Look at Intel. We've gone from a situation where they couldn't produce enough of the stuff to now the cuts. The cuts on spending, the cuts on hiring, the cuts on the workforce that's already at the companies. James, that's happened quickly. Can the rest of the economy go the same way? I mean, yeah, essentially it can, John. I mean, but obviously inflation is a, is a rate of change, and so you, you need constant forces driving it um, driving it higher in order to maintain those sort of large increases. So when it comes to the inflation picture, broadly speaking, higher prices in the past tend to mean uh, sort of lower inflation in the future. That has been the pattern. I think energy commodities are possibly a fly in the ointment there. But in terms of cyclical activity, I think there are plenty of signs out there, not just in the US, but everywhere, that, that tomorrow is going to be worse than today. And we really are in fairly early stages of this. And, and as we discovered during the pandemic, right, chips are in everything. So if people are just buying a few less washing machines, if people are just buying a few less cars, all of these things are depressing demand for chips. And because of the lags involved in, in production and supply chains and what have you, it's almost inevitably the case that, that production capacity is increased at the worst possible time. Um, and so you then end up with this inventory overhang, you end up with this supply overhang, and that tends to depress prices even further. We're seeing that, obviously, in, in goods inventories in the US, but I do think that will be part of the story again in 2023. James Athey, sticking with us alongside Stephanie Roth to the two of you. Thank you. Equity futures positive this morning across the board. Coming up, it's the home stretch. President Biden's final push ahead of the midterms. One of the most important elections in our lifetime. It's going to shape... The outcome is going to shape our country for decades to come. And the power to shape that outcome is in your hands. 24 hours to go. That conversation up next. important elections in our lifetime. You have to get out, you have to vote, or we're going to have a problem. Our economy continues to grow and add jobs, even as gas prices continue to come down. Our country has never been so bad as it is right now. He's doing stuff right now, solving problems right now with a Democratic Congress, and he can continue it if you vote. You're going to elect the incredible slate of true America first Republicans. Up and down the ballot. This election requires every single one of us to do our part. It's that important. A busy weekend of campaigning and a busy weekend of clarifications. President Biden sparking criticism from within his own party. It's also now cheaper to generate electricity from wind and solar than it is from coal and oil. We can accommodate that transition. No one's building new coal plants because they can't rely on it. 
we're going to be shutting these plants down all across America and having wind and solar. Senator Manchin from Virginia slamming those remarks, writing the following. Comments like these are the reason the American people are losing trust in President Biden. Being cavalier about the loss of coal jobs is offensive, disgusting. The White House walking those comments back. The press secretary saying the following. The president's remarks have been twisted to suggest a meaning that was not intended. He regrets if anyone hearing those remarks took offense. Joining us now down in D.C. is Anne-Marie. Morning, Anne-Marie. Good morning, John. What really an embarrassing moment for the Democratic Party ahead of a midterm election. They're having a spat within themselves about the future of energy, of course, um, in this statement where the president's remarks were walked back by his press secretary. They were saying that the comments they felt like were twisted, uh, pointing to, without naming him, Senator Manchin's remarks, because the president was talking about what was economically and technologically changing in the energy space. At the same time, John, it also is an awkward moment for the fact that the whole world is dealing with really an energy crisis. We are not as far in the transition as many would have hoped or liked to see. And we see that this summer we saw that rising uh, gasoline prices. And um, unfortunately, we'll probably see that this summer, uh, this winter, excuse me, with home heating. And already there's an issue happening in the Northeast because we have incredibly low supplies of diesel to heat homes. And this is something that this administration is already grappling with. And Marie, the question I've got, and I think this is important for market participants as well, how long is it going to take to get the results from these midterms? Uh, well, well, as I told you and during surveillance, Jonathan, you and I could be talking about the composition of Congress uh, for the next four or five weeks because we may not know until December because Georgia may end up being a runoff election for the senator Herschel Walker versus uh, senator the current incumbent Warnock that could go into a runoff election and that may be the deciding factor of who whether or not it's the Democrats or the Republican have control of that chamber. Hey, MH thank you. I'm Marie down in Washington. We'll be catching up a little bit later. I'll be heading down to DC with the team. Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz for special coverage tomorrow and on to Wednesday as well. Stephanie Roth and James Athey back with us. Stephanie the first question to you. How do you think this market will deal with a prolonged battle of runoff races, say a runoff race in Georgia. Four more weeks of this stuff. I think it might might put, put be a bit of a headwind on, on markets, but I think the more important thing is really going to be CPI. And I, I heard this morning on surveillance, you were asking guests, you know, which is more important, the election or CPI? I would say the inflation outlook for the next couple of months is going to be much more important, especially when we're thinking about the Fed potentially causing recession in this U.S. economy. James, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely, I do. I, certainly, uh, it seems unlikely that the House is going to be uh, in, in sort of embroiled in, in uncertainty for weeks and weeks and weeks. So if, if the Republicans win the House, then essentially the Democrat lock on Congress is over. And of course, it does make a difference at the margin whether the Democrats are in control of the Senate, but it doesn't become such a big issue then. So presuming, as, as we expect, the Republicans win the House and do so fairly handily, the fact that the Senate race drags on, I don't think is significant for markets, particularly, uh, you know, agree with Stephanie completely. The CPI number has the potential to be a much more dramatic market, market moving event. From the market's perspective, I get all this. I understand that in the short term, it's all about having some certainty over fiscal policy, perhaps constraining the ability to deliver more fiscal stimulus and spending that would complicate the Fed's effort. We've got all that, Stephanie, in the near term. What I struggle with in the longer term, Stephanie, if we don't have the availability of a counter-cyclical fiscal buffer, at a time when the economy is rolling over. Do you think we, re we revisit this and say, maybe actually it's not that bullish having divided government? I think we have to assume that we're going to be having divided government, in which case the market is likely you know, pricing that in to some extent. We're not expecting to have a, a big fiscal stimulus in, in, in the onset of recession next year. So it's likely all, hand, all hands are going to be on, on, on the Fed in order to, to stimulate policy, and, and they probably will, but it might take some time because they want to make sure that inflation is, is truly cooling. So we shouldn't really expect much from, from fiscal next year, and I, I don't think the market would was surprised by that. James, your response? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I th one of the one of my biggest concerns, and this has been the case for, for quite some time, is just the extent to which we believe that each and every recession requires some dramatic policy response to offset it. 
um, because you know th there's nobody sitting around any of the tables who's prepared to accept any short-term pain um, and in doing so they're quite often sacrificing long-term stability um, and the long-term long-term health of the economy I think one of the big issues is that things have become so imbalanced because there have been so many and so frequent efforts by policymakers to deal with any and every little downturn in the economy the idea of you know Schumpeterian creative destruction has been completely eschewed and in doing so we have you know however many zombie companies in the US which are sucking up capital and not using it productively we have savings which is way too high because we have such a, a skewed sort of concentration of income and wealth amongst people and amongst corporations um, we have reduced competition across a number of sectors which permits that to happen all of which is a headwind to potential growth to structural growth rates and, and short-term spending actions from governments and easy monetary policy as far as the eye can see are not helping these problems they're making them much worse so it would be nice in, in my mind if we could get to get to a place where governments were investing for the long term and monetary policy was far less activist but I'm, I'm not, not sure that, my breath on that front I'm not sure they're going to embrace your view of Austrian economics anytime soon either James but we can run with this just briefly Stephanie, I hear a lot of people say short and shallow. Our audience hears that all the time. If there is no counter-cyclical buffer here, a counter-cyclical circuit breaker from monetary policy anytime soon, from fiscal, it's not going to have the ability. Doesn't that tell you something about duration of a potential downturn? Could this persist longer than people think? Sure. We think it, would, it could look more like a typical recession, a recession that lasts about four quarters, has an unemployment rate rising up to 6%. The, the argument that it's going to be specifically short, I think, is a difficult one. But where we would push against is a, a severe and deep recession. That we don't think will happen. So we don't expect anything like the great financial crisis. The economy is, is fairly healthy. There's not that much leverage in the system. But sure, it could look like a normal type of recession where you, you do get job losses and, and the unemployment rate does rise. It's been nothing normal about the last 20 years. Stephanie Roth, James Nathy, to the both of you. Stephanie, thanks for joining the programme. James, to you as well. Futures right now at four-tenths of 1% on the S&P, coming up the morning calls and later. The man himself, Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, on why the bear market rally might be able to continue. That conversation coming up. The opening bell, just seven minutes away. Five minutes away from the opening bell, equity futures up a third of 1% on the S&P. Coming off the back of a week of losses on the Nasdaq, down by about 6% last week. Biggest weekly loss going all the way back to January of this year. Trying to bounce back again and build on Friday's gains. The Nasdaq 100 up four tenths of 1%. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Wells Fargo downgrading Costco to equal weight. 490 price target, highlighting a weakening consumer and potential currency headwinds. That stock is down by 1.6%. Next up, Berenberg downgrading Estee Lauder to hold. 220 price target saying the company lacks visibility on a potential recovery. We're down by 1.6% there to 207. And finally, Barclays trimming its Apple price target at 144, seeing growing risk to Q1 estimates after cutting its outlook for iPhone shipments. We're down there by 1.3% at 136.50. Coming up, Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson expecting the midterms to keep the bear market rally going. That conversation just around the corner with equity futures up a third of 1% on the S&P. This is Bloomberg. Four seconds away from the opening bell. Equity futures just about positive, up a third of 1% on the S&P as we kick off a new trading week. And I say the same thing every single Monday. Big week ahead. CPI coming up in the midterms. I would say it's a big week ahead on the Nasdaq right now. Up a half of 1%, kicking high on the Russell as well. The small caps of 6.10. Stage your opening bell, switch on the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this on a 10-year. Unchanged on a 10-year at 4.15.45. In the FX market, Euro dollar had a sneak peek at life again above parity a little bit early this morning. Right now, back to 99.94. We're positive four tenths of 1%. Crude unchanged, 92.53. Still trying to get used to it again in the 90s. 92.55 now. Basically unchanged on the session. At the opening bell on the S&P, we're about 20 seconds into this. I'll bring up the scores on my terminal on the S&P. Up a third of 1%. Utilities kind of lagging at the moment. Communication services top of the pile up about nine tenths of 1%. Breaking things down for you is Katie Greifeld. Hey, John, well, let's start with Meta after that Wall Street Journal report over the weekend that the company plans to start cutting thousands of jobs 
this week. Shares are actually rising, though, and that's what's interesting, maybe because the company is starting to get serious about cutting costs. This, of course, as it's still burning billions of dollars in the metaverse, but that's another story. Apple, too, we've got some news there. Uh, the company said that shipments of its newest premium iPhones will be lower than previously expected. The company said demand is still strong, but it's China lockdowns that affected operations at a supplier's factory. That means longer wait times ahead of this holiday season. Shares only off uh, about half a percent or so. Outside of tech, well, let's talk about Disney because the stock is rallying ahead of tomorrow's earnings report. Disney expected to widen its streaming lead over Netflix. Shareholders seem excited. Shares are higher. JD.com also in the green. It's one of several Chinese internet ADRs higher this morning. The government there saying that COVID zero policies are still in place. That theoretically means more time spent online. You can see JD.com shares up over 3%. Back in the physical world, though, you have U.S. natural gas soaring this morning. That's as a winter storm hits the Pacific Northwest. That's boosting lights of Southwestern Energy and EQT, John. I've got complaints about Disney's Hulu, Katie. <laughs> have you seen the price increase from uh, 75 dollars to $82.99? My husband handles that, John. Does he? That's not your thing. I'm handling that right now. It's a problem. <laughs> Katie, thank you. The S&P up four tenths of one percent. I'm not sure I've handled that at all. Taylor Riggs, onto the midterms. I was going to say you only like Hulu because the Kardashians are on it, John. But how did that, you know? How did you know? Because I know that you love Kendall Jenner and Kendall Jenner only. This but is let, true. <laughs> let's get to the midterms. And on a serious note, those opening bell that you talked about. Take a look. Historically, really interesting calls coming out this morning. On one hand, you Morgan Stanley saying yes, the traditional sort of correlations hold up in midterms. Equity to December looks pretty good. Evercore ISI though coming out and saying you know what, maybe not so fast. This year could prove to be different. Regardless, I know that we'll all be keeping our eyes on tomorrow and sort of the performance as we head into the end of the year. Take a look at sort of the probability. Hard to be a betting person, but when we take a look at the MAGA ETF relative to the Democratic ETF, in that terminal chart, you'll see that maybe the Republican ETF rises just a little bit relative to that and then predicted the odds of both a Republican House and a Senate. And that is the blue line as well, elevated but off the highs of the session. So if you're a betting person, that's one way in which you can look at it. I think all in all, John, though, for the market, how we're thinking about this is how is equity performance heading into the end of the year in a mid-year year and this is it november actually looks pretty good it looks really good in a midterm year much better than either an election year or neither year so that is the momentum heading into this month i was a big fan of revenge bodies with chloe as well <laughs> for the record no one believes this anyway so it doesn't matter taylor thank you on the equity market on the s p up a third of one percent on the nasdaq up two tenths also morgan stanley's mike wilson expecting stocks to overcome another challenging week he wrote the following this morning the bear market rally was severely tested last week with the fed's clear message that it's far from done we think it survives again with the midterms providing the catalyst for lower bond yields and higher equity prices i'm pleased to say that mike joins us right now mike i want to start if it's okay of course with last week's note not the week over the weekend when you said the Fed meeting is critical for the rally to continue pause or even end completely, Mike, when I watched that Fed meeting, I was kind of kneeling or kind of leaning into the end of that one, maybe it ending. Why can this continue? Yeah, thanks, John. Good to see you. I mean, look, I, uh, we got to be flexible here. And what I would say is that the message last week from the Fed was pretty mixed, right? The, the statement itself was dovish. You know, the market rallied off of that. And then the press conference was a bit more hawkish. And Look, this is the ambiguity that we have now, right? People have to interpret uh, these statements and these reactions on their own. It's not going to be that exact anymore. The Fed doesn't exactly know how they're going to end this, and neither does any investor, including ourselves. What we do know is that we're getting closer to the end, and the rate of change probably on the pace of hikes is coming down. And that's our forecast, 50 basis points in December, 25 in the January meeting, and then they pause from there. And that's a, you know, that's a quick ending. So that's enough for uh, the bond market to potentially rally at the back end, uh, particularly if we get the outcome in the elections that we expect uh, tomorrow. Let's get to the midterms in a moment. Do you consider the end of hiking the end of tightening? And it sounds like you do. So let me ask you this. Would you consider a Fed that pauses and stops hiking, but a recession that rolls over to be tightening or not? Well, it's all one and the same, right? So the Fed is likely going to achieve its goal. It already has in terms of slowing the economy. Uh, ultimately, I think they'll be successful in getting inflation down because it's not really about the Fed so much as it is about the excessive fiscal spending. 
and, and of course, what that did to demand. And that is already fading because of demand destruction from prices and, of course, as people run out of money. So I think it's all one and the same. And, and look, the, the, the trickiest part here, John, you know, is that, you know, do we decide, you know, is there going to be a window of opportunity between the end of the Fed hiking cycle and the recession itself? You know, this summer we wrote about that. We said it's too early to think about the Fed ending its rate hike cycle, so we didn't try and play that rally. This time, though, we think there could be this little window of hope, particularly at the year end when there's pressure to perform and people have to chase uh, stocks in the year end potentially. And, and, and as Taylor was saying, you know, the, the midterms historically are a positive catalyst for at least for the month of November. Well, let's talk about where you want to be long within the equity market. The recent outperformance in the equal weight S&P over the last couple of weeks is clear for all to see. What's the signal you take from that, Mike? Well, look, I think that the, look, the equity market uh, leadership um, is fading, right? So technology has been a massive underperformer this year. Consumer discretionary as well. We've been underweight those groups. And the question, of course, is like, what's going to take over? And I think what's interesting, like what we're trying to do, John, as you know, we're, uh, you know, we look at the internals of the stock market to help guide us. And we're, we're getting close to the end of the bear market. We're not there yet. But, you know, what you want to what you want to try and figure out is what outperforms in the last leg down, because that will tell you what's going to outperform in the next leg up eventually when we get there. And that's been industrials, financials and some of the commodity complex. And that makes perfect sense to us. Right. In the next uh, economic expansion next year. Uh, we think that there will be a major leadership change uh, from the former leaders to these new areas. You think tech gets left behind? Well, look, I mean, the, the reality is, is that there are plenty of good tech stocks that will be fine. Um, the reality is that there's too many of them, right? And, and, there's, and they got overvalued. So it's not that technology is dead in terms of the spending trends. We're very bullish on technology spending. However, there's too many competitors now and the valuations just got out of whack. So we got to take that out. And yeah, so there'll be a lag. There'll be a laggard probably in the next recovery cycle. But that doesn't mean there aren't great single stock opportunities within that. The midterms, let's go there. It was in your note this morning. Is that just a risk event, Mike, we need to clear? Or does it have outcomes that have consequences one way or the other? Yeah, no, I, I view the CPI as kind of this risk event that needs to just get it out of the way. It's sort of like, who cares? You know, it's backward looking data anyways, but we got to, you know, we got to get through it. And then we're pretty confident that six months forward, inflation will be materially lower. That's our forecast. And so it's just, that's, that's kind of the risk event that just has to come and pass. The midterms, though, however, could have lasting implications if it's a decisive victory for the Republicans. Because, you know, as I said before, I, we think the majority of the inflation spike was a, a result of excessive fiscal spending. And that, of course, will be curtailed even if the Republicans just win one chamber. That's not to say that the you know the, the Republicans are fiscally conservative to it, you know incredibly fiscally conservative, but it does throw a wrench into this idea of a single party, which the market also likes the idea that not have no one party having single control. So ultimately, it should be good for bonds. Bond yields lower has been key to our tactical rally call, as you know. And, and look, I want to make it perfectly clear, John. If we don't get you know rates to come down, the rally's over. You know, we had it 39, 39, 50. Um, but, you know, we see enough in the tea leaves and enough in the technicals to suggest we should hang out and see these two events this week play out first. Mike, different views, though, and you've written about this in the past, so I'd love your view on it now. Are rates going down because there is this increased perception that the cycle is ending, the hiking cycle is ending, or are rates going down because perceptions of global growth are rolling over? And in the near term, I get it, you trade on just the move. But when do you start to trade on the reasons for the move into next year? Yeah, look, we're, you know, so we, you know, we have to kind of serve many constituents. Um, this is a trading call, okay? Um, for our core, you know, kind of view, we, we remain of the view that the bear market is not over, primarily because of the view we've had all year, which is that earnings ultimately will decide the end of the bear market. And we think earnings expectations for next year are significantly too high, maybe as much as 20%. And that will happen over the next three to six months, meaning the numbers will finally come down Part of the reason we threw in the towel on that happening now is because we just got a sense that companies wouldn't talk about 2023, which they did not, and therefore the earnings remain high for next year. But make, I want to make it clear, over the next three months, we think that will change. We think companies will discuss 2023, and the reality will set in that the numbers have to come down. That will form the bear market low probably sometime in the first quarter of next year. Are we seeing signs of that now with some of these tech companies, Mike, reporting cuts, hiring freezes or layoffs? Well, let's separate that because, um, first of all, we saw many of these large tech companies report, you know, pretty weak third and fourth quarter. But then we actually look what happened in 2023 numbers. They didn't come down that much, at least for the majority of them. And 
part of that's just, you know, kind of laziness of the numbers, nobody talked about it, so they just kind of keep them there. But then I want to talk about the cost cutting, okay? So, I, look, this is the way, this is, the, this is what will get us bullish, by the way. If we saw more aggressive cost cutting, not just by the tech companies, but by companies more broadly, this acknowledgement that we have a cost problem, and you know, obviously we don't want to see people get fired, but you know, layoffs unfortunately are a part of that slowdown. When that layoff cycle picks up in earnest, that will actually be one of the keys for us to get bullish because that means the bleeding will stop on the operating leverage. Final question, you hinted at the answer to it a little bit earlier in the interview. I've asked this question all morning, Mike. You get the choice, the outcome of CPI or the outcome of the midterms right now, I can give you one, what would it be? If I could see it right now, Clarence speaks. Um, I would say uh, I'd probably rather see the midterm election outcome because that has more lasting impact potentially. Mike Wilson, thank you, sir. As always, Mike Wilson there of Morgan Stanley, still looking for that bear market rally to continue through the next couple of months. Equity futures were positive going into the open. We come out the other side about 11, 12 minutes into the session with positive two tenths of 1% in the cash equity market. On the NASDAQ, we're basically unchanged. Coming up, debate over China's reopening plans, reaching a fever pitch. I'm not quite sure what a pivot on COVID lockdowns quite means in China yet, but it's certainly not going to be a sudden reopening to, as we saw in the Western world. It's going to be more nuanced. And the latest on Apple's production difficulties, that conversation, up next. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Microsoft President Brad Smith. That's at 1045 in New York, 345 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. I'm not quite sure what a pivot on COVID lockdowns quite means in China yet, but it's certainly not going to be a sudden reopening to, as we saw in the Western world. It's going to be more nuanced. And as such, I'd be a little bit cautious about some of the optimism which is happening in Hong Kong. Economic headwinds piling up as China doubles down on its COVID zero policy. Health officials saying previous practices have proven that our prevention and control plans are completely correct. This is the demand slowdown worsens. China's trade taking the hit with exports falling and imports shrinking for the first time since 2020. Mike McKee and Damien Sassar here with the latest. Mike, morning. Good morning, John. Well, you can easily see what the problem is with China. They have been much more strict than the rest of the world. When you take a look at the stringency index, the uh, measure of how tight their policies are on locking down, the U.S. and I just picked Germany have fallen tremendously and we're pretty much reopened, whereas the Chinese, you can see, are still very, very tight. And that's having impacts across the board, not just on trade. You mentioned the exports and imports, but Chinese growth remains really slow there. Uh, trade deficit, uh, trade surplus rather widened because imports are so low at this point. 10 percent of China's GDP still under lockdown, according to Nomura. And there are rumors of a COVID zero policy change that, as you mentioned, are being shot down by the government. So nobody quite knows what's coming out of China, except that some companies like Apple <laughs> are having problems. There was a massive frenzy last week, Damien Sasser, in the market off the back of these hopes. What's the truth to all of this, Damien? Well, first of all, I don't know what the big surprise was. I mean, it was obvious that exports were going to get a hit here. I mean, look at South Korea. Exports declined for the first time in two years. Look at freight rates between Shanghai and Los Angeles. They're down 80 percent over the last year, Jonathan. So things were boiling to a head. But to your point about the equity market per action last week, look, what it says is you've got very, very light positioning from foreigners in China. And so it doesn't take a whole hell of a lot to move the needle. And that's exactly what we saw. Look, I mean, I'm not saying, suggesting that there's real value in China right now, given the geopolitical and legal overhead and the property sector, of course. But the reality is, light positioning makes for easy markets. And so I think that's a lot of what we're seeing here. Well, it was a messy market over the last few years, that's for sure. Damien, Mike, thank you. Mike mentioned Apple. Let's talk about Apple. The COVID zero policy in China weighing on multinationals. Apple feeling the pain and seeing significantly reduced capacity due to COVID restrictions. This coming amid a Bloomberg report blaming demand woes for at least 3 million in total production cuts for the iPhone 14. Ed Ludlow has to make sense of this. Morning, Ed. 
Yeah, good morning, John. Apple down for a sixth straight day. Its worst run of declines since January. The stock trading at its lowest level since June. You're right. Two key pieces of news, one on the supply side, one on the demand side. Let's start with the demand, demand side. Apple expects to produce three million fewer iPhone handsets this year. According to sources, it's instructed its suppliers to build 87 million down from 90 million. And according to sources, that is principally due to softness in demand for the lower end base iPhone. 14 handset models. You'll remember in September, Apple had actually originally instructed its suppliers to boost output of the iPhone overall, but then walk those back when we got those initial uh, pieces of soft demand. And then at the same time, there's the supply issues too. Apple said Sunday that shipments of the premium iPhone 14 Pro models will be lower than expected due to COVID lockdowns, in particular in the Zhengzhou region, where Foxconn, its principal assembler, uh, has a, 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 the bulk of their activity for the Pro models, the higher end versions of the iPhone 14. Apple also warning customers globally that as a consequence of this, there will be an extended waiting period to get your hands on an iPhone 14 Pro model. Why is that important? We're in the final three months of the year, the key holiday season. The street very much worried, not just about volumes, but about the bottom line as well, because the net result of this being fewer handsets is also the mix will change. Fewer shipments of the higher ASP, higher margin Pro models, should impact the bottom line. Um, there's also a really interesting take from UBS on this, John, real quick. They're saying that the market has not yet factored in these disruptions in China for fiscal uh, 1Q or full year 23. And that actually, according to UBS, the market is, quote, way too optimistic in its revenue and earnings projections for Apple for this year, which indicates actually we should take this much more seriously than the street currently is. And how seriously are they taking it? Are they rethinking production in China? Yeah, I mean, we already know the story here, right? Particularly as it relates to Foxconn, the main uh, supplier that assembles the iPhone. They're trying to shift away from a reliance on China to India. But the reality is that 80% of these higher-end iPhone 14 Pro models are assembled in the Zhengzhou region. Um, this is an area that we've reported on, right, where they've been hit hard by quarantines. Workers have fled the region because they can't get into their workplaces. And right now, the government, uh, relating to what Mike was talking about on the policy side, only are allowing medical personnel onto the streets of that city. Uh, it's impossible to run a factory in that scenario. So, yes, long-term, Apple looking at outside of China and towards India principally. Apple down for a sixth day. Ed, thank you. We're down by 1.8%. Ed talked about the analyst community. B of A, Barclays, both cutting targets this morning. Deutsche Bank lowering Q1 estimates. JP Morgan saying Apple. And the latest news implies downside to Q1 estimates as well. Just a range of analysts rethinking maybe the story on the margin. The S&P up by a little more than a tenth of 1% with a sector price action. Back with us, here's Katie. Well, John, the S&P 500, it's just about flat, but you actually have eight of 11 sectors higher right now. Energy is out in front. You do have crude back to flat, and like we talked about, you have U.S. natural gas surging this morning. Consumer discretionary to the downside. That's a lot of the travel names. But the story this week, of course, is the U.S. midterm election. So let's look at what the sector action looks like in the run-up. Over the past week, it's interesting. You have aerospace and oil services, those pipeline companies. They've both rallied relative to the S&P 500. Not fantastic games, but for context, you have the S&P 500 down about 2.4% over the past five days. On the other side of the trade, you have green energy, those cannabis companies both trailing the big benchmark. So it could be a sign that markets see Republicans winning control of Congress. But John, your guess is probably as good as mine. I don't have a guess right now, Katie. Clueless, as always. Katie, thank you. About 20 minutes into the session, equities down now on the S&P by a 10 for the Nasdaq by four tenths of one percent in the bond market up six basis points at the front end your two year all over the place last week close to 480 post payrolls in the first few minutes then the lows of last week close to 440 right now 472 472 highs we haven't seen in the last week going all the way back to maybe 2007 up next your trading diary from New York this is Bloomberg
five minutes into the session this Monday morning. Good morning to you. We are basically flat on the S&P, negative two tenths on the Nasdaq 100. Some losses this morning, marginal losses on the Nasdaq and adding to the losses of last week, down six percent on the Nasdaq 100. Worst week coming all the way back to January. The bond market looks like this, two tenths and thirties, your two year. Look at the front end up six basis points again and back through 470, 471, 75 on a two year, just off the highs of Friday, which were close in and around. 480. That's the price action. Let's get you the trading diary. Big week ahead. White House press briefing coming up at 145 Eastern time. Fed speak picking up with Collins, Mester, Barkin all on deck. U.S. midterm elections on Tuesday. The results on Wednesday might take longer than that. Then we get more Fed speak. Williams, Barkin speaking on Wednesday too. And finally, jobless claims followed by another big CPI print in America. CPI Thursday just around the corner. From New York, equities basically unchanged. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.